Hi everyone, welcome to our event. This event is brought to you by Data Docs Club, which is a community of people who love data. We have weekly events and today is one of such events. And by the way, today at 4.30 our time, we have a workshop, so check it out. It will be about Kubeflow. So if you want to find out more about the events we have, including this Kubeflow workshop, there is a link in the description. So just go there and uh, see what we have in our pipeline. Very important, do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Now the UI looks very different on YouTube. I still need to redo the screenshot, but I think if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, you will find the subscribe button, I'm sure. So click on that link on that button and you get notified about all future events like as awesome as this one. And we have an online community where you can hang out with other data enthusiasts. It's a Slack. So check it out too. During today's presentation, you can ask any question you want and we will be covering these questions, I think, at the end of the presentation. Or should I interrupt you while um, you're presenting something? What do you prefer? Towards the end, sounds good. <laughs> Sorry, at the, at the end, okay. So we will do this at the end. Um, please ask the questions in Slido. And with that, I am stopping sharing my screen and the floor is yours now. Thanks. Thank, thanks a lot, Alexi. Let me share my screen and I will go press play. I hope you can see my screen. Cool. Um, thank you all. First of all, thanks to Alexei and Data Talks Club for inviting me. Uh, and great to see that your number of subscribers is very close to 20K now. It's really big. Probably the biggest data community, right? Uh, one of the biggest, I would say. I don't know. Probably yeah, the, the number is quite outdated now, actually, yeah. when you just look at the number of subscribers at 26.8. Yeah. So I need to update. I really need to update. <laughs> <all the points. laughs> yeah. As a product manager, these numbers are really important for us, you know. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, great to be here. And uh, so today I'm going to be sharing more about how, you know, machine learning is working in an identity verification company uh, with uh, Verif. Uh, which is where I worked uh, as of now. Uh, I'm a product manager. Uh, my focus area at uh, Verif is uh, mainly machine learning um, or AI, which is a broader term, I would say, uh, which involves um, biometric uh, processing. So which involves like face verification, identifying faces, seeing if there is any fraud in the face or not. So that's one area that I focus. My second focus area is around document tampering. So uh, when people submit documents uh, using our solution, uh, we need to also check if there is any kind of fraud in the document uh, or if the document is tampered. So these are my responsibilities as of now. So which involves a lot of machine learning. Uh, also taking into that uh, broader uh, processes and business logic to mimic uh, human function, um, uh, automating it as well. So that's hence the AI part of it. So in today, I want to actually start by speaking a bit about Verif, uh, because uh, since most of the things I share is about a document or uh, what we are doing here, it will be interesting for you to know what is our business how the solution works. So you have some context uh, of what I'm speaking. And then I'll try to introduce some AI management techniques, uh, which I have seen used in different companies and how these techniques are mapped uh, into our solutions. Um, then in the third part, I'll speak about machine learning. So what exactly are our machine learning problems and how we structure our organization to do that. And in the fourth part, I'll share an example of uh, a problem that we see, or let's say a general machine learning problem and how it start from problem to solution uh, to getting into customer. What is the process look like, you know, from identifying the problem to building the model to getting into the production. So what is the process like? Mm, and finally, some challenges. So I'll be sharing a bit of a step ahead because uh, as you may know, because we are a, a company which is identity verification, I cannot really share a lot about our algorithms because in the end, we don't want people to understand exactly our solutions because 
we don't want fraudsters to <laughs> reuse this in some other way, which will create more problems for a lot of us, including myself. Um, so feel free to ask questions in the Slido link Alexa shared. I'll try to answer it as much as I can towards the end. Um, so meet Verif. So uh, probably it's the uh, first time you are hearing about us, but you might have used uh, or went through our identity process one way or the other in some time uh, if you use some of our clients' products. So uh, Verif is an identity verification company. So we help our clients or businesses to build trust with their customers. So essentially when the business is transacting with uh, any of their customers uh, or end users, they want to understand who they are. So we are enabling, uh, we are the mediator that enables uh, to build that trust. Um, so in, we were founded in 2015 by Carol uh, in Estonia. And right now we have around 600 plus uh, global customers, uh, which is in different markets, fintech, crypto, gaming, mobility. And um, uh, we also are mainly focused, our markets are like UK, US, and uh, EU. Um, the company is quite big. So we have around 500 plus people. Uh, our offices are in Estonia, Spain, where I'm based right now in Barcelona, UK and US. And we are on Unicorn. Uh, we valued at 1.5 billion. Um, initially in Y Combinator and now uh, invested by a lot of the most uh, famous VPs um, uh, in the industry. Uh, so that's a general overview of the company itself so almost eight years old uh, we've been working with a lot of clients uh, i will introduce some of our clients um, later down and uh, our focus is essentially helping our clients to build that trust uh, with our end users and why uh, this product exists is because uh, we slowly see that paradigm of moving from offline to moving online so one example is when I moved to Europe, maybe uh, almost nine years ago, when I moved to Belgium, I have to go to the bank with my passport, uh, my visa, and with my residence address proof, print everything out, take an appointment, submit all these documents. And I don't speak the language. It was a very troublesome process, while now we don't do that anymore. So when I was using products like Revolut, uh, the main fun thing for me was I don't need to do anything. I can submit everything online, right? So that is there, but it also comes with a big problem that we also need to verify what these people are submitting is legit or not. So a lot of businesses lose a lot of money and uh, even all these fintechs uh, with regulatory uh, requirements uh, and challenges is to prevent all this fraud. And uh, we at Verif also are trying to make sure uh, that what we submit uh, or what we receive from our clients are actually uh, legitimate and you can actually transact with the end user uh, with trust. So the key to trust is identity and that's what we believe. Um, so these are some of our clients. So some of you may have already used all some of these products like Wise, Bolt, Duolingo. So if any of you have went through any selfie or document submission process with any of these clients, you are actually uh, going through Verif. Uh, you may not realize it. Uh, so that's why I said many of you might have used our product directly or indirectly. Uh, so uh, we are kind of like that uh, mediator layer which builds uh, trust with your uh, customer data. So this is how simply we work. So if uh, we offer an SDK solution, we also have APIs, but uh, ideally you, once the business makes a decision that this person needs to get verified, let's take an example of one of the clients that I mentioned before, Wise. They decide, okay, I need to see the identity of this person. So they will ask you to essentially take a picture of your driver's license or the document. Uh, which could be passport or residence permit, which is decided by the business. So they decide which document they want. And then um, once you take the picture, we'll also ask you, hey, can you take a selfie of yourself as well? And 
we will process these pictures and we give a feedback as well. This is some minimal ML, which we need to check if the document meets the quality requirements or the selfie meets the quality requirements and whether our models will be able to process these documents or pictures. So we just do this initial, very low level, simple quality checks. And then once you pass that, uh, we check the document in an automated way with different machine learning models. And then we give a decision whether your session or verification is approved or not. So this happens in a very matter of less than a minute uh, or let's say seconds, uh, unless there is some kind of decision errors, which we run into, which I will try to explain later down how we handle those cases. So this is a simple verification flow uh, where our clients can use our SDKs and they can integrate it. And you may not even see our branding because they can customize it the way they want. So as well. So this is our value proposition. We have around 97% customer retention. 90% uh, automation rate. So when I say automation rate, what it means is uh, this entire flow is 100% automated without any manual intervention So and pass rate. So whenever you submit, do a session uh, at the first attempt, we are able to pass 95% of the times. Um, so now I want to go into the second part, which is more about how AI management techniques work and how we map into those. So uh, traditionally, any business who are making a lot of micro decisions wants to automate it. So that's how we, uh, let's say, build rules or any form of uh, any form of automation, right? So let's take an example of Tesla. So Tesla would decide, okay, I want to build a driverless car. So what they do is they decide to, uh, from point A to point B, how can I help the user to get there from point A to point B, and they built different algorithms around it. But the way the system is modeled is also important here. Uh, they also need to think about the edge cases where the their system may not perform. Let's, when Tesla is in a new road, it never seen, it may not perform as they want, right? So now they need an intervention of the driver. So they need to keep that when they build the system. So and for instance, if Tesla says, okay, I can build a car without a steering wheel. So how the driver is going to now intervene uh, into the driving process, right? Now you need to teach the driver, then you should uh, intervene and how to intervene. So this can be complicated. So what I'm trying to say is it is important to think, even when you're automating, when humans to interfere and when you shouldn't interfere, right? So that's where these four techniques come. And many, many times, many organizations knowingly or unknowingly build systems in any of these categories. So human in the loop is when you have a process in place, it's automated uh, with machine learning and AI can be a broader processes that is trying to replace a human or uh, mimic a human cognitive function. And human actually is, uh, is actually assisted by that particular machine. So uh, that is human in the loop case. Um, so some of the decisions may be made by human while most of the decisions are made uh, by the machine itself. Human in the loop for exceptions. Here, the machine makes most of the decisions while only when exceptional scenarios arise, uh, the human is interfering uh, for it. And the other example of human, uh, now the human on the loop is one example could be when uh, let's say you are having a forecasting model or and you're forecasting, let's say I need 10 people to do this particular job. Now you can use that decision and human can override it and say, hey, 10 is not correct. I need 12 people. So that is human on the loop. And that feedback of 12 is now used for future iterations of the model. So you are calibrating the model by the feedback saying, hey, 12. Okay, now the machine knows that feedback of 12 and it can use that to improve its recommendations in the future. Um, the last one is where human is kind of out of the loop where human, most of the decisions are made by the 
AI without any intervention and human is only calibrating it. So let's say you change a little bit of thresholds or you say some parameters, uh, but most of the decisions are 100% of the time made by, uh, made by the machine. So you have these four techniques and you choose one or the other based on the risk of the business, the problem that you are trying to solve. And sometimes you also use a combination of both. And only danger is people sometimes get stuck in one of these and they never uh, iterate over any of this. So you may start with uh, directly with, um, ideally, if you are in a risk-based business, it's always good to have human in the loop. So you start with a very human in the loop approach before going directly into a uh, hundred percent automated machine-based uh, algorithms. While some of them start with 100% machine and they realize, oh, there is a problem. Now we can go back into human in the loop. So it's always good to think about uh, and map your business use cases and problems to make a cautious decision from day one rather than going back and forth uh, between all this uh, to avoid cost of processes and cost of, uh, uh, you know, uh, cost of resources as well. So how does Verif does is we are traditionally human in the loop with human in the loop for exceptional offerings as well. We, we generally stand between these two, while there are some internal processes, which I could say could be on the other two as well, but mostly what our customers see is human in the loop or human in the loop for exceptions. So we offer that by having a configurable verification engine. So our system is very configurable that uh, to the client, essentially has a profile and they can choose uh, the group of uh, decision-making that they want. So we have fraud systems. They can choose whether when two humans should interview or when they shouldn't. Data extractions, like as I said, when you submit a document, you need to extract data from it. And then decision-makers. So we have based on the different uh, algorithms, we can make a decision whether you should pass a verification session or we should ask for more details, or we should ask for a human intervention. So again, this is configurable uh, based on the needs of the clients. And notification, so once we made that decision, we tell our clients, hey, we made this decision, we are approving this session, or we are rejecting this session, or this is going for a review process from us um, as well. So we notify this decision. And we also have a back office configuration where people can see uh, the clients can see all the verifications we did. So configurability is one of the important aspect uh, when we build this AI system. And this already has a profile associated to it. And that profile is very configurable. So we have two offerings. So one example is our hybrid offering. So hybrid offering is an example of a human in the loop. So you have a majority of the decision making is done in an automated way. So let's say you are verifying this document. Uh, we extracted everything correctly. Um, and our automation is really confident that this is correct. Um, only time when we actually think the confidence is lower or our ML algorithms is having a confidence which is not high con uh, highly confident enough in any of the thresholds, we can decide to go into a manual fallback and where our in-house team can manually review it. So essentially these kind of sessions could be mostly likely to be fraudulent sessions or it could be because of any input extract, input quality. So if the image is blurred, the algorithms cannot make a decision. So uh, we actually mitigate the risk of attempt uh, of actually, we are mitigating the risk of approving any fault sessions just by going into this manual fallback and improving the overall accuracy of our decision-making with this hybrid offering. Uh, the, the human in the loop for exceptions offering, we call it full auto. It is essentially, we make the full decision making without any manual fallback. We only tell our clients that, hey, there is probably an exception and it's up to the client to decide on whether they want to make um, any investigation on the issue or not. So we give that flexibility for the clients to take control over the end decision based on the configuration with our full, fully automatic offering as well. Um, so 
Having said that, now you have an understanding of how our systems work. I wanna slowly go into the topic of machine learning at Verif and how we do machine learning and what are the different needs for it. So every machine learning problem, in my opinion, should start with real understanding of what our customer needs. That's the business acumen, right? So you need to understand what the expectations are. So for our customers, these are the general eight expectations that we expect from our customers. So the first one is being compliant. So being compliant means this is a regulatory product because you are doing essentially document processing, biometric data processing. So we need to comply with local regulations uh, in terms of identity documents, but also for, let's say, data protection as well. Like if you are operating in Europe, you need to be concerned about GDPR, for instance. Or if you are you operating in US, you may have its own uh, regulations for data processing. And user experience is really important. Uh, because you are asking people to take a selfie and a document, right? So in machine learning, you can say more data is better, but to gather this data, we may sometimes have to compromise, sometimes have to co compromise the user experience, right? So sometimes you may have done a verification process where the, the pro during the process, they may ask you to move your head or say some random words. So Ideally, this can be really good data points for the machine learning, but when you think about the user, it may be a bit of a, <laughs> they may think, why is the machine asking me to do this, right? So we need to find the balance between user experience and more data points. For us, for machine learning, if you think from a data scientist perspective, wow, this is great because I'm getting more data, I can build more models around it. But what if the user doesn't want to do that? So we need to find that balance between user experience and what is the right machine learning approach for this. Response times, we cannot wait uh, or the users cannot wait forever or let's say even more than a minute for a decision. They want fast decision making. So our models have to scale there as well. Global scaling, it's important to have support documents from everywhere, classifying the documents correctly uh, as well. Reliable partnership. So we are a SaaS provider, so we need uh, partnership. We are not just uh, looking for just revenue. It's a partnership where we help our clients to grow and our clients help us uh, as well to grow and uh, getting better on a daily basis. Ability to handle spikes. So in identity verification, there is it's there can be some seasonalities as well. Uh, let's take an example. Tomorrow, Vice decides to do a campaign of uh, okay, if you open a Vice account, you will get 100 pounds. So people, there will be a lot of new traffic coming in. So we should be able to handle this verification sessions really fast, right? Conversion rate, as I mentioned, we want people to finish the verification sessions uh, really fast and uh, uh, without any drop off. And fraud prevention, it's really important that because this is a regulatory product, as I mentioned, there is a lot of identity theft. People can fake documents, people can submit uh, deep fakes uh, as their face, or they can generate an AI video and submit it as their biometrics. So we need to have controls in place to mitigate all this risk. So from this customer needs, now I want to map this into our machine learning expectations, right? So I'm mapping this into three main categories. So many in general, our machine learning models are always measured for all this scalability, accuracy, and automation. So scalability is Essentially, our ML model works globally. We don't want to build a model that is just very specific for one country or one specific region. We want a model that is actually scalable across different markets and documents. This is the challenging part, but this is the general principle that we need to keep in mind uh, or we keep in mind when we build models. And our infrastructure is scaling proactively that our model, our MLOps infrastructure is able to uh, you know, handle all the traffic that we want. And the response time, as essentially with feature processing and having real-time decisions, have very low response time. In terms of accuracy, uh, we have key metrics for each and every model to make sure our decisions are accurate. So we need, to, we check our extraction, extraction accuracy and identification accuracy. So when we verify a biometric phase, or when we extract something from the document, or when we say this document is 
from this country, we all make sure that the decision is accurate and we have process in place, which I will explain on how to make sure this accuracy is there. Um, it's important that we need to fine tune uh, our models based on clients as well. So that configurability aspect, as I mentioned earlier, is very important in SaaS that uh, we cannot just build one model and expect uh, it to work 100% of the time for all the clients. We may need to move some parameters or thresholds some optimizations very specifically based on the geography that they operate uh, as well. Ability to handle high risk-based decisions. So this is, uh, I would say, risk covers. We need to find that trade-off whether your model should have a high precision or a high recall, essentially. So do you want to let, uh, uh, do you want to be optimized more towards recall? Then there is a problem that you may send lot of sessions for manual reviews sometimes, right? So we need to find that trade-off between precision and recall, and that flexibility is also there. Automation uh, is, you, meet, you need to be highly confident in automating something. So let's say if you know, you have a, if you have a, if your model has a normalized score of zero to hundred, uh, let's say your model is all the time saying it's 60 to 70%, then it means it's not highly confident, it's neither low confident. It's somewhere in the medium layer, right? So we don't want that to happen because we want to make highly confident decisions and we should have highly confident models as well. So this expectation is also set for all our machine learning models uh, in general. Um, so these are some of the general family of problems that we solve in general. So we have document extraction, which is uh, essentially classifying the document. So when you submit a document, you have something called specimen classifier, which will classify which specimen it is. So when I say specimen, it's some uh, speaking about, let's say this Irish passport, our model will tell, okay, this is an Irish passport. So now once we know which is the specimen, it looks for the fields and extraction as well. And once it's extracted, we usually cross validate it with the MRZ code, which is the NFC chip or the barcode to make sure there is some consistency about the extraction and the actual data we can get from the MRC code. So we do this for any document extractions we do. And then we have biometric analysis. So when you take a selfie, we take the selfie photo and confirm the is the user is who they are. It's not AI generated, it's not defakes. Uh, it's actually not, it's actually a legit person. It's not something people are showing some random photos from internet, or it's not shown from a mobile phone, for instance. So we do this biometric analysis. That's another family of problems that we solve. And fraud prevention. So we have different data points. So when people use our SDK, we can get uh, where they are doing the session from, how many sessions have they done in the past. We know which document it is. Uh, and we, we are able to use all these data points in building models that are able to, you know, prevent fraudulent sessions from happening. And we also have uh, fraudulent fraud controls over our biometric selfie and document extra document uh, in general as well. So these are the general three family of problems that we solve, uh, though this may be very small, but you can actually list maybe close to more than 50 more than 50 models uh, doing all these different jobs in different scale, different scales. So that's a wide range of uh, ML problems that we are solving. So for that to happen, uh, we need data and we have very strict data management policy in, in as well because we are handling highly sensitive data. Because when you think about it, we are handling people documents which are very highly sensitive like passport or residence permits or social security numbers. And then we also are handling the biometrics as well. So uh, just because we have the data, people always ask me is, hey, you, your job must be really easy because you have all this amazing tons of data from different clients. You can just build an ML model, right? But the reality it's not because you cannot just use all the data that we have just to build ML model. First thing is we need to have client agreement in place. So when you negotiate the terms with the clients, the clients needs to agree that, okay, this data could be used for ML purposes, right? So that agreement have to be in place. And then we also have some contractual obligations 
to have retention as well. So I said the client, the, the company's live for eight years. We cannot just go back in time and use all the data from the last eight years. So we have this challenges around data retention as well. So we need to be careful in ML uh, how, uh, which data we use. And data access management as well is important. Um, not all the data is available. So that's access control management. And finally, the consistency. So once we have the data agreed and chosen for training process, we make sure uh, the curated data set is consistent. So uh, when, especially in terms of facial biometrics, let's say you are labeling where is the eyes or where is the uh, where is the mouth like and facial points, uh, we need a, a consistent labeling rather than inconsistency. So this consistency is important. So enormous amount of time and energy is invested in data management as well in uh, in solving this all these ML problems as well. So I wanted to call that out explicitly because people do have sometimes the assumption just because you have the data, you can build a model. That's not the reality here. So usually our teams are organized in, uh, as I mentioned, legal and data protection is uh, one of the main horizontal. Then we have a team for data curation and annotations. So essentially, once the data is agreed and it could be used for training, they actually uh, annotate and curate data sets for machine learning purposes. So this team actually makes sure that the data they curate is actually available for training and they could be used for machine learning. They know that they also work closely with the legal to make sure the regulations are met. And we have product analysts who actually make sure the machine learning monitoring is in place, the metrics are correct. And if there is any drop uh, in the metrics that I mentioned before, scalability, automation, accuracy, uh, they suggest changes as well. And we have a data science platform which enables our data scientists to deploy these models at scale. And we have product teams that is actually have this data scientist uh, who will work with product managers like myself in identifying the problems and improving, uh, improving the models. So essentially, uh, this structure allows us to make sure that all our requirements uh, from our business expectations are uh, met and then our regulatory challenges from data protection is met as well. So, and importantly, probably some of the unique team that is very specific maybe for data creation and data annotations, because not every company I have worked has this team, uh, because since we are building identity documents and uh, biometric analysis, uh, we need to curate our own data set, which means we have our own curation process and annotation process. We cannot just randomly go into the internet and use a random data set to build a model, uh, or we cannot just use all the data we have as well, as I mentioned. So in the next part, I'm actually going to speak more about a very example-specific problem, like how uh, the process is going to look like from taking something from idea into production, right? So this is the product manager's view. You may think this is uh, this is like a very large process, but it's it's quite fast. But in general, usually for any any ML development process, it goes through this general. So we have client feedback. So we have feedback from clients about performance of machine learning models. Uh, if some model is not performing well, we get the feedback. We also have ongoing quality control. So what I mean is. Among the decisions we made by our model, a sample is reviewed manually by our in-house team. So they review a sample of the decisions we made uh, by the model. So we know uh, how our models are performing with some level of confidence and some margin of error uh, for the population. Because we are a SaaS company, we don't know all the time the decisions made by the client and user. So this ongoing quality control help us to understand the performance of the model. Then we sometimes do targeted focus reviews. So let's say we want to improve our biometrics. We will do a dedicated quality control review over a one year period or six month period to understand any behavior that um, we can pick it up. Then we have this model monitoring process, which is done on a weekly basis or ongoing basis daily I go and check that how the models are performing, uh, how it's performing globally and integration specific as well. So for each client or each market, 
do we see any trend or variations in our performance of the model, right? So then we have this prioritization process with the engineering data scientists and product analysts, uh, where I will see that, okay, there is an issue. Okay, let, now let's take it to the team. Let's prioritize it. And it, then, the, the, then the development part is usually, once the problem is identified, there is a um, time where you experiment different hypotheses you have and find a solution, take it to the annotations team. They will curate a data set and then the model training and development process happens. So once you have the model ready, then we will work with our solutions team where they will you know, integrate it with the clients and uh, there is a product marketing process to announce it. So it may sound like a very broader process, but essentially product manager kinds of coordinate all these activities from identifying the feedback from the client into the release of the new model. Um, let's take an example of, uh, of a sample problem. And this is an example problem. So let's take an example that our client is sell, telling us that uh, there is a lot of document tampering happening uh, and uh, you need to look into why, right? So in this particular example, this is, uh, this is an example that I created a couple of days ago just for this session. So here, I, this document is a specimen, which is not like a legit document. It's an example document by the government, uh, which is uh, issued for people to understand how this actual document will look like, right? So you can find this in the internet. So I just downloaded it and I just took a screenshot of it. And during the verification process, people are submitting this. So here there is multiple issues. First thing, this document itself is, uh, is doesn't exist because it's a specimen. Uh, you can clearly see. And uh, this is submitted from a screen, image in a screen. So this document holder doesn't have this document. He's submitting it from a laptop screen, right? So uh, we do actually have models to detect that, but let's let's for the sake of this example, let's say the model is not performing well and uh, our client is not happy and our metrics are going down. So the first thing what we usually do in these kind of scenarios is doing qualitative and quantitative validation. So qualitative validation is essentially, we will go back and review the model performance uh, based on our quality control review. So our quality control is reviewing uh, sessions, as I mentioned, on a weekly basis. Since this model already exists, we will already have the data to say uh, where exactly is the model performing? And if the model has made any error, incorrect decisions where accuracy is bad, we know what exactly was the case. And they also label the mistakes. So they also label, okay, in this case, people are submitting browsers more, or let's say desktop screens more. Maybe the model was optimized just for mobile screens or just a tablet screens, right? So now we need to, we know that there is this problem of, model not being able to capture uh, documents that are shown from desktop screen. Then quantitative validation is essentially taking feedback from customers. In this case, um, because we are a SaaS provider, we may not be able to go back to every customer, but we actually do is to reviewing the behavior for that particular customer. So how this model is performing for that particular customer. So that's a validation that we do. So once we know do that validation, we know the different problems that we have associated with this particular model itself. So based on the analysis, identify all the possible gaps. So uh, since you are doing the analysis, identify all the po possible gaps. Gaps have a list of identified problems. So um, here in this example, I have identified the problem is with the desktop screen and the model not being able to identify those cases. And then I do prioritization. So this is essentially among the identified problems, what is the easiest or simplest with minimal effort with maximum impact that I could solve, right? So we will identify maybe among the 20, we will identify the most recurrent top five or top 10 problems that are very easy to solve. Uh, so it doesn't re require a lot of time. So once that, that what that is done, we do quick experiments. We do an experiments with the uh, existing data sets, uh, some experimentation hypothesis testing. And then once we know the exact solution, we will ask for a data curation set to create 
and label specific examples for us to retrain the model. So in this particular example, we wouldn't go back and choose only Spanish documents. It doesn't make much sense here. What our goal is to find all the examples where documents were shown from screen and that's it. So uh, we try our best not to be specimen focused or document focused. In some models, it may make sense, but here in this particular example, this is very generic problem, which we try to generalize into uh, this desktop screen. So once we have the data set ready, we proceed to actually model training and development process, as I mentioned earlier. Validation is an important aspect for us because we are a regulatory product and we cannot just release changes uh, without any uh, agreement, right? So we have this validation set, usually a general model validation set like any machine learning. Then we try to do golden data sets where we have the list of all the problems we have identified and how much uh, this situation is solving. So let's say you have 100 problems. If this situation is solving 80%, that's great, right? So we have some understanding of impact there as well. Then we do shadowing. So we, before rolling out, we run the model in the shadow to see the performance. If there is an impact in the automation, any accuracy or any changes. And then once we do that, we take the shadow results to QC. So QC will review the shadow results manually for a sample set and say, okay, this model is performing for this scenarios, but not ideal for this scenario. So based on that understanding, we will fine tune it again and do a canary rollout uh, to, based on the agreement with the clients just for one or two multiple clients. So essentially that the process, uh, in this particular case of screen, we will essentially do the same process. The QC will have to review and roll it out to, not to maybe not to all clients, again, it depends on the agreements and what the clients want and how the performance matters. Finally, some challenges we have. Essentially, as I mentioned, we are a regulatory product. Uh, we have data policy challenges. We cannot use all the data. So we are very conscious about it. Curation, uh, we need to curate data for new use cases, essentially from scratch. Some of the times we cannot just use any, any data set from internet, for instance. So this curation can take time. Monitoring in the context. So essentially, if you want to monitor drift or any kind of uh, in-context monitoring, we need to know the ground truth. Many times in our use case, it's very hard to get the ground truth because uh, we are selling the decisions to our clients and client can make a decision which is quite agnostic or which is not known for us. So to get that ground truth event is not always easy. Uh, that's why we do QC reviews. And this is always a debatable topic, have a generic model or a specific model. So sometimes we need to make trade-off. Sometimes specific models work, while some, sometimes generic models work. And keeping up with the fraud trends is also a challenge, uh, especially these last four or five months with the trend of AI-generated videos. Uh, there are super high definition videos out there, which can be challenging for all the time for machines. Now we need to go through the entire process of curating data sets maybe. So this can be challenging. And as I mentioned earlier, UX trade-off to find the balance between finding the right user experience and getting the data. So these are the, some challenges we have right now. So I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna take some questions from you all. So. Maybe I can go into specific or some of the details uh, if you have uh, questions. Uh, so yeah, please feel free to drop your questions. So I'm happy to answer that right now. And there are quite a lot of questions already, six oh, wow. of them. And uh, so I just want to people to see the slide, maybe take a screenshot if you need contact information, um, if you want to follow up. Um, yeah, I think now you've had enough time to make a screenshot because now I want to share my screen. Yep. And on that screen, there are questions. So if you can stop sharing yours, uh, let me... I think it will be easier for you if you can also read questions from yeah. screen. Sure. Okay, so let's start with the first one. Where do you see the most errors or exceptions that require human interventions? Um... Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, in all the pro and their pipeline, we can see <laughs> um, errors or exceptions. Uh, that's a generic answer, I would say. 
but the first one is uh, usually in the in the document extraction itself uh, because uh, sometimes you know uh, we are extracting information and if the lighting is not clear we may not be able to extract all the time all the pieces of information and that's one one generic common thing the second one usually is um, when it comes to fraud we always require human intervention any slightest for fraud that's very common uh, that most of the sessions uh, we that end up in human intervention somehow is also can be fraudulent but it's not all 100 the case but um, it could be in the form of people submitting random uh, selfie image uh, from showing it just like in the phone like this or like the example I showed in the screen uh, usually we flag those for human intervention so it's uh, it happens across the pipeline because it's a lot of machine learning models and it any of them based on the risk can flag for human intervention uh, so I know it's it's a very generic answer, but I cannot really go into the specific of which exactly is a human intervention required because it means that people can uh, abuse that part. <laughs> but I also assume you do some sampling, right? So even though um, like the model is not flagging anything, yeah. uh, for some cases you still want to see uh, to do some quality control, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Like well, because yeah, you want to see both precision and recall, right? So like precision would be like when you see something is flagged by the model and then you yeah. uh, go and check, but they also want to, to, to have this recall, right? Correct. So we do actually sample for each of every, uh, let's say the check we do, like decision checks we do, we have sampling and we do it sampling and that level. So we know how our granularity understanding of if the model is actually doing uh, as it should be. So then uh, it means we have a big team of Q QC. It's not, uh, that's a big work as well, manually going through a good sample set of, uh, let's say thousands of uh, sessions on a weekly basis to check, uh, to have enough confidence, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, I guess, one of the challenges you mentioned is exactly about that, like how do you monitor these models? Yeah. Yes. Okay, that is a that was a question from Gregory that he asked in the in live chat. So thanks for the question. Um, another question from Adonis. Uh, so how does the first Verif product or MVP compare to today's product? I know you are relatively new there, but I don't know maybe if you can answer that and which were the greatest learnings that led to, to that. Um... From what I've seen, even in the processes, uh, of course, it's not here today as the way automation is, right? So it was a manual, uh, like every MVP, there is a lot of manual process involved. And uh, that was the initial product, which was quite man close to manual, um, which you can see like probably machine was only assisting a bit, not too much decision making. So today it's uh, very automated a lot of the pipeline is automated so that's actually that automation focus was like a, quite a good step for Verif especially to be a competitive in this market to have that automation without less manual and it also helped us to scale because uh, if you want to actually scale a product uh, with high accuracy and automation you need to have uh, less I mean I'm not saying manual is uh, not uh, accurate manual is accurate but man humans can also make mistakes right but it's not easy for us to do millions of sessions just manual so that shift into automation really helped us um along with that we also were cautious about fraudulent controls and make sure that automation is actually uh not opening up more doors for fraud so that was the thing and second about learnings I think uh, in terms of automation and getting uh, into the state where we are, um, I think machine learning models uh, was like the way we model is also important, as I mentioned, uh, not to be very specimen specimen focused, to be have generalizable models that help to scale fast. Um, then you also need to be very conscious in making the decision whether you want a generic model or a very specimen agnostic model unless the trade-off is really big 
um, um, try to build more gener generalizable models. I know it's not a good advice uh, for many use cases, but as I mentioned, you need to do that conscious questioning of uh, whether I want to be very, very optimized uh, for a micro problem or a micro decision, or I want to be uh, more optimized towards a broader decision. I think that's a very good learning to have. And I think this is kind of related to this question, which is like, do you create a new model for each new customer? Um, right. So um, kind of similar. Yeah, it's similar. Uh, the short answer is no, which is not like a, which is, we don't need in general to create a new model for a customer. Um, and ideally as a product manager, I personally don't like doing that either because we have around 600 clients. Uh, I cannot go and create one model each for one customer. But uh, one thing we do is we try to see with our product analyst what is the optimal threshold. Uh, so that is, it's not actually creating a new model. It's actually optimizing it for higher performance based on their expectations, right? So this next question is about id.me fraud, which I have no idea what it is. Uh, do you have any information about that? Have you heard about this? Uh, it's a competitor, so. <laughs> so the question is, speaking of how people scam, what are your thoughts on the id.me fraud where people tricked the system to get unemployed? It used a similar system of ID and selfie. Have you heard I, about that? I, I maybe if you can give me a context, I can read about it and uh, speak uh, in. Um, yeah, I don't see any, uh, maybe without report. Yeah, I don't see anything in the news about that. Okay, maybe like maybe if uh, Anonymous could be so kind to give a bit more details about that, we can try to answer that. Okay, so the next one, could you elaborate on the differences between these two or four kinds of activities, uh, human assisted by AI and human over the, I think it's one of the earlier slides yeah. you have, like there was like three, right? Uh, yeah, there were four. So first, I think, which one, let me try to see. In the loop, right? Then maybe yeah. you can just share your screen if you, if you uh, think it's similar. Yeah. So let me try to bring that back up. So. That's the inconvenient part in, of the Q&A Q process, <laughs> switching screens. <laughs> Um, so human, uh, so I think the first question was about human over. Yeah. So the question was about human assisted by AI and human over AI, human assisted by the, I think it's the human in the loop, right? Yeah. So human in the loop is usually you have, uh, most of the decisions, um, uh, let's say, let's take an example of this verification session. Uh, we have, let's say, 100 decisions to make. Uh, we, hum, the machine already has probably made all the 90 decisions, and the human actually can use that 90 decisions to make the remaining 10 and the final decision whether to approve a session or not. So essentially, uh, what I'm saying here is the final decision is actually made by the human, but irrespective of that, uh, a lot of the decisions are available and humans can use that as a context. In very one example is we have this manual agents who reviews a session. They can actually see each and every model's confidence uh, about uh, how confident the model is about that particular decision the model is making. And they can also see the metadata. So metadata is more like the intermediary decision points. So uh, we give that context as well to the humans so they can make that overall decision fairly accurate. Uh, human out of the loop, probably it's more like the last part where um, we don't particularly do that here because of the risk-based approach we are. Uh, ideally, it's more like end-to-end -end decision. Let's say you have a system with 10 machine learning models and some cognitive rules and other logic let's say like Alexa, uh, so you have a full system. And uh, here, 
in that system, there is no intervention, actually. Everything is end-to-end -end from user interaction to the full conversation, right, with Alexa. Uh, what you are doing is people in Amazon may be calibrating it at some point. Uh, on a So here, the human is out of the loop. There is no actual involvement uh, in the decision-making process. So I think the key idea is when you model a system, you actually make that conscious call of where you put the human uh, or based on your risk, essentially, because it really goes back to the uh, goes back to the business and the clients. Uh, in the regulatory clients I work with, like even at Rebel, you'd, we were very focused on human in the loop because we are a regulatory sensitive product. Uh, so we cannot really make end to end decisions while for some models, which is not te technically AI, so I don't want to call <laughs> say that, but if you have like a very growth focused, let's say forecasting without making any decisions, these are end-to-end -end process which doesn't have much high impact. So these can be fully automated models. I, I hope I clarified a little bit more. <laughs> Do I understand correctly that in case of human in the loop, the first one, human has always... Um, has always be in the process, right? So that there is a process and then the final yeah. decision is always by a human, right? So there is no way that a machine can fully automate the process and do not involve. While yeah. in the third step, which is human, what is it, out of the loop or? Yep. Um, then like, oh, I think it's the second one, human only for exceptions, right? So then uh, most of the time human is not involved, but when there are tricky cases, then they are shown um, by, I think right. a good example could be moderation, right? So for example, yeah. for YouTube, um, like somebody uploads a YouTube video and this YouTube video might include some violence or something that violates terms of services. Yep. Um, like humans do not review every single piece of video, right? But when the model thinks that it's a suspicious, then uh, like a human yep. intervenes and then makes yep. the final decision, right? Yeah, correct. Okay, then the last question is, how do you generate training data for your models? And I must admit, this is a question from me, so I also put it there. Because <laughs> uh, that was one of the challenges you mentioned, right? And I, when you had this example of the idea, I could already imagine that maybe you have a team of people who would, you know, collect all these ideas and take pictures from different angles, from different... Uh, uh, with different light conditions, like at night uh, when the sun is, shi is, shi is shining and all these things. Uh, yeah. Do you have a team for that or how do you yeah. do this? So, yeah, that's a good question. So first thing, since we do quality control, we already have some of the labeled mm -hmm. sessions already. Like we know that, okay, these sessions over the last, let's say, uh, three months period, uh, since the last retraining, we have this much fraudulent cases that we have seen. So we have that label sessions already from the quality control process. And once we do that, then we also do like based on the amount of data required, we have this team of curation. Their job is to carry over and curate data set. And we actually do some augmentations, like varying different like, and we add some kind of noise in an automated way just to make sure there is some kind of divergence. But most of the scenarios, since we do have this huge uh, volume of data, uh, which um, is kind of, we can use it right away just by labeling, uh, we use that. So in the challenge is usually when it comes to new use cases. So let's say I wanna build something really new, which we don't do anymore. Uh, let's say I want to recognize uh, someone's gender from their voice. So we don't do any voice processing right now, but let's say tomorrow I want to do that. That could be challenging because I need to, at that case, we usually have more annotations team working very close on this fo focus, but uh, we haven't gone into that territories yet, but we did explore a bit about synthetic data sets. So it's more like uh, you can... Uh, especially for some checks, like uh, people like, you know, ask you to tilt the heads, all these things, uh, you need to generate some data sets, but we don't do that as of today. Uh, most of the data comes from quality control and uh, we have this team of curation and annotations. They actually build the data sets for data scientists. 
And I guess it also comes back to the question from Adonis, which was about like first NLP compared to what you have right now. Let's say you need to add a new country or process a new type of document. So then maybe you can just have a human in the loop that makes decision. And then, so you have a stream of data coming to you from the clients, yep. the customers, then you just use humans to annotate them. And then over yep. time you build yeah. the data, right? And we do do that. Yeah, we do have this, uh, you know, internal verification tooling where people manually verify and they are actually labeling to some extent, you know, which specimen it is as well. So uh, we have this process in place. And for new specimens, some of these classifications, you don't need a lot of data. So because it's simple classifier and uh, we can really build a, uh, because it's document classification itself. Uh, if you have the extraction and context right away. I think it's not like super, you don't need a lot of instances. So we already can do it uh, with our existing data plus using the extractions we do like, you know, uh, it, 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 most of the documents mention if it's a residence permit, where is issued from. So all this data can also be a supplementary information for our classifier to make a decision, right? So uh, yeah, but the challenge comes when it comes to very, you know, uh, complex problems, which will involve biometrics and uh, uh, other features, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot. That's all we have time for today. So thanks a lot for joining us today, for sharing all that with us. And uh, if anyone of you wants to ask a follow-up question, like if you can just rewind 15 minutes ago, there was a slide with contact information. Yeah, um, or you can reach out to me in LinkedIn or yeah that's probably the easiest way right just uh, it's not that difficult to find your uh, you you there right okay and we will make sure to include the link to the description and uh, yeah thanks it was fun uh, uh, seeing this chatting with you at the end uh, thanks for the q a session and yeah looking forward to having you one more time here sometime soon yeah. thanks a lot thanks